Hi friends, welcome to the Friends of France podcast. In this safe space, we are favored in each episode with the presence of an expert guest from different fields and specialties as we learn about their life journeys, their successes, possible regrets, and realizations, their work, why they do what they do, and even their life outside of work. In here, we tear down common myths and misinformation with up-to-date, evidence-based science and data simplified for anyone to digest. We don't shy away from topics that can sometimes be polarizing or taboo. We normalize the humanization of healthcare and its workers and we promote the importance of self-care and safeguarding your mental health. Please keep in mind that the conversations in this podcast are for educational and informational purposes only. They are not implied or intended to be a substitute for professional medical diagnosis, advice, or treatment. Please always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers regarding a medical condition. Are you ready? Let's go! Hello, hello. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. We are finally here. First episode of the second season of the podcast. Yay! It's been a long time coming. I've been working this for such a long time now. Ever since the end of the first season back in July. It is December 23rd and I can't believe that in two days it's Christmas. Like where did 2022 go? In fact, where did 2021 go and 2020 and 2019? Anyways, as quickly as time is flying, this month of December has been, ugh, let me tell you, I had an emergency surgery during the end of November and I had to stay in the hospital for six days. I almost died. My appendix was three times the normal size of a human being. But guess what? We are here, we're alive, and that's what matters. Now, if you can tell by the title, Dr. Shiva Gofran at your cervix, hehe, <laughs> do you get the pun? And the photo cover of the episode, if you could see the female reproductive system, and a pelvic bone, and a virus, and a vaccine, I am so excited for you to hear our conversation today. This was live streamed back in January of 2022 for Cervical Health Awareness Month. And that was the time that I had Omicron, which by the way was the third time I got the Rona. You know, at least someone loves me, right? <laughs> Anyways, that's why... Once you start hearing the episode in a bit, you will hear, and we talked about it, that <laughs> I was literally like coughing up my guts. But in my mind at that time, I thought that it was so important that we should raise awareness about cervical cancer. Because according to the American Cancer Society, in 2022 alone, there's an estimated of 14,000 new cases in the United States of invasive cervical cancer that would be diagnosed. And you know, all of these numbers are very daunting and can bring so much fear and anxiety, which is so understandable. That's why I thought, why don't we bring in an expert to talk about cervical cancer? Can it be prevented? Are there common signs and symptoms that one need to look out for? And many times, cervical cancer is also tied to HPV or human papillomavirus, which is classified as an STI or sexually transmitted illness, or as we probably know as STD or sexually transmitted diseases. And STIs and STDs bring about so much taboo and stigma into the conversation, so many people don't want to talk about it and many don't want to touch that topic. But you know what? That's where contagion arises. That's where fear arises. When we don't touch upon topics that may require some precautionary measures or preventative measures. This leads to so much health detriment and also misinformation online. For example, the common misinformation that only women can get HPV, which we will tackle today as well. And this goes along for so much more misinformation about other STIs like herpes or HIV and AIDS and chlamydia and gonorrhea. This is why I have the greatest honor of having our expert guest today, Dr. Shiva Gofrani, a board-certified OBGYN physician with two decades of experience, a Castle Connolly top doctor, featured in the PBS show Human the World Within on Netflix, with featured writings in Huffington Post, Cosmopolitan, Parents Magazine, and WebMD. Dr. Gofani is also very open with her own experience within the OBGYN world herself as a patient, having travailed six miscarriages, three births, endometriosis, weight loss surgery, and even ovarian cancer. This is why she co-founded the Tribe Called V, which is a virtual women's health platform. She is such a superwoman, and I can't wait for you to meet her. Are you ready? Let's go! Hello. Oh, oh my God, honey, you look so good and fresh despite your COVID. Oh my gosh, I was just gonna say, doc. People will be like, "Oh, he sounds sick. He looks sick. I am sick. <laughs> I yeah, do have the." I Rona. mean, you sound stuffy, but honey, you look good. Oh, your skin looks you so good. Much. Your hair looks good. How do you feel? <laughs> thank you. It's the third time. I know. Um, I just saw genetics. that. That's crazy. Amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah. At this point, I'm just like 
hopefully I'm a superhuman enough that yes. I have you natural have immunity, immunity times three, <laughs> vaccination times three. I told yes. my friends, if I have it at the fourth time, the only logical explanation is this virus is in love with me. And that's it. I know, <laughs> it is. Well, and here's the truth so we can help like dispel any, it doesn't mean yeah. that the vaccines didn't work yeah. because you actually do, all joking aside, you look good. I'm sure you don't feel great. <laughs> but you're not as sick as you might've been, so. Oh, definitely. During my first time that I got it back in September of 2020, where we had no vaccines yet, I was sick for the whole 14 days of isolation. Couldn't breathe so close to go into the emergency room. I should have probably. Couldn't swallow my own saliva because my throat was hurting so much. I mean, I'm stuffy now, but yeah, my fever stuffy. my fever and sore throat lasted for only two days. We'll take it. There we go. But Dr. Shiva, such an honor for you to be here with me tonight. Thank you, Thank you for being our first guest for the second season. It's January, National Cervical Health Awareness Month, which is mm-hmm. such an important topic. And there's no one else better that I thought of to <laughs> invite than you, Dr. Shiva. If you could just first please introduce yourself to everyone and thank you again for being here. Well, honey, thank you for doing this. And I actually, I love, I mean, I, I hate the internet for so many reasons, <laughs> and yet I love the internet. And this is yeah. the best part about the internet is that we can actually not only talk, even though we live in different states yeah. and haven't met each other officially, mm-hmm. but also we can really try to, like you said, add some humanity. And yeah. talk openly. I mean, the thought that, mm-hmm. listen, I don't even want to talk that much about COVID because we're all yeah. so tired of talking about COVID. Yeah. But I think there's, like I always say, there's data. And then there's mm-hmm. what real people see. Like mm-hmm. we are real humans. Mm-hmm. We are real mm-hmm. people, doctors and mm-hmm. nurses who what we see is yeah. forgetting data. It's, yeah. It is what we're living. And so I think it is powerful to talk about. So thank you. Mm-hmm. So my intro, I guess, quickly is that I, my name is Shiva Gofrani. I've been an OBGYN for 22 years. So four years in residency, 18 years in private practice. Yes, I know. It's exhausting. <laughs> and we love it. And I myself have been through enough health issues that it's helped me really inform how I would talk mm-hmm. to patients because I can jokingly mm-hmm. say like, I've been through this and not in a, I've been through that no big deal, yeah, but in yeah. a big, I've been through these things. They were challenging. And yet mm-hmm. let me tell you the nuggets I've learned and let mm-hmm. me be open to the fact that I don't know everything. So yeah. I had ovarian cancer five years ago, which is why I love talking about pap smears because we'll talk about the myths of the pap smear because yes. it has nothing to do with ovarian cancer. Yes. Um, I have three kids, but in the journey to have three kids, I also had six miscarriages. So mm-hmm. I think it's good for us all to highlight yeah. things like, you and I are human. You've been through COVID yeah. three times. And yet, look, you're still here standing, looking <laughs> robust and resilient and healthy. I've been through miscarriage and a lot yeah. of things and ovarian cancer. And yet I'm still here, mm-hmm. robust and healthy and exhausted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I really, I welcome the chance. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Thank you so much. And just as an intro, medicine is such a long, long, long road, especially becoming a doctor of medicine, right? Four years of undergrad. <laughs> a grueling application series to get into Mm -hmm. four years of medical school, three to seven years of residency amounting up to anywhere between 12,000 hours to 20,000 something hours of training, fellowships if you choose Mm -hmm. to do so. Where did that inspiration come from? And I know you told me that you're a post-bac student yourself in the past. Was there a family member? Was it a friend? Was it a personal experience? Yeah, well, I mean, this is why I laugh because I truly mean this when I say I love being a doctor, Mm -hmm. but I do not love being a doctor for many of the reasons that many Mm -hmm. doctors love being a doctor. I don't Mm -hmm. love the science part. I don't love Mm -hmm. necessarily the fact that, you know, I'm the one who's treating people. I love that I get to engage with people. Mm -hmm. And I say that very openly because I do think that there are a lot of humans who would be amazing at this work, but they're scared off from it because Mm -hmm. the pre-meds alone are horrible. And I was one of those people because my parents are actually both retired doctors. They were very clear as immigrants who came to America as doctors that they did not want my sister or I to go into medicine Mm. merely because they were doctors. Even though, by the way, Persians often push their children to be (laughs) doctors and medical engineers. So I heard. Right? And they were very clear that they shouldn't push us to do it. We should only Mm. choose it if we really loved it. And Mm. I did not love it. I actually, Mm -hmm. we joke, I passed out when my ears were pierced. I watched my dad do a couple of small procedures and almost Mm -hmm. passed out. I was the last thing I wanted. (laughs) But through undergrad, I switched majors four times. I ended Mm -hmm. up not really knowing what I wanted to do. I really loved fashion. I liked jewelry Mm -hmm. design, but I didn't ever think I would be successful enough to Mm -hmm. do it. And I honestly fell into the pre-meds as a means to do something concrete Mm -hmm. because I didn't know Mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. And I was Mm -hmm. lucky. 
that after graduation, I took my pre-meds in the city. Mm-hmm. I had a great time doing it, despite mm-hmm. the fact that it was exhausting. And mm-hmm. I wasn't particularly good at the pre-meds. They're really mm-hmm. challenging, right? Yeah. Bio, I mean, um, general chemistry, organic chemistry, organic physics. Chemistry, yes. These are not things uh-huh. I was good mm-hmm. at. And so mm-hmm. I do want to say to anyone starting out thinking about pre-meds, even if you hate the work of the pre-meds, if you think you'd like being a doctor, stick with it. Because not mm-hmm. once have I used <laughs> physics, general chemistry, or organic chemistry in any of my time as a doctor, right? It is a weeding out process. They want yeah. to make sure that you can persevere. Yeah. So I stuck with it and I persevered and I'm so glad I did because what I discovered was that I love engaging with people. Mm-hmm. It's not that I, you know, that the only thing in the world I could have done was be a doctor. Mm-hmm. I could have done a lot of other fields that I would have mm-hmm. ended up liking, but I'm so mm-hmm. grateful that medicine is what the medium that I kind of use to yeah. engage because I have like a built-in system where I get to feel good about myself and yeah. I get to support myself and it's actually just a beautiful field, but it is grueling. And I don't think anyone should do it unless they're sure they like it because yeah. it's, it's all encompassing, right? Yeah. It really alters our lives. Definitely. That being said, I mean, other than just the science aspects and the schooling aspects and the time involved, there's a lot of mental health involved, right? Lots of sacrifices, time, the money you spent on it. Having been in practice for two decades. Do you have any regrets in pursuing such a long and arduous path? No, I mean, I really don't. I have to tell mm-hmm. you, like, I I think there are there are moments in anyone's career, mm-hmm. like last week when I was on call 24 seven and I had, you know, <laughs> gruel sure. night and yeah. exhaustion. There are yeah. always gonna be moments, but I mm-hmm. think that would be true with anything. And it's yeah. I, even in the deepest moment and darkest moment, I still never regret that I'm a doctor. I do mm-hmm. think at times this is actually so much stress and anxiety for any of us to mm-hmm. bear, forgetting COVID. Mm-hmm that mm-hmm. it sometimes makes me wonder why we choose it. But I mean, yeah. I, I would personally say I really love it. That said, I would say yeah. the same thing to my kids that my parents said to me. Yeah. I would never try to encourage someone to go into it if they're mm-hmm. not sure they want to do it. Yeah. But I would try to highlight the misconceptions that dissuade people, right? Mm-hmm. Like the misconception mm-hmm. that if you can't do well in pre-meds, then you shouldn't be a mm-hmm. doctor. Mm-hmm. I think that that's just wrong, right? Yeah, but no, I, I really don't ever regret it. And um, yeah. it's not to say I think it's the only thing I could have done. Like I said, mm-hmm. I don't think there's, mm-hmm. I think there's many different um, career paths that many of us could have taken yeah. and enjoyed. Yeah. But I'm grateful that this is the one I did because it's incredibly yeah. fulfilling, right? Yes, and yeah. so encouraging. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. after through all of that, after through all of the schooling, OBGYN, um, yeah. was this field something that, always been in your mind or you saw it during clerkship rotations in medical school or yes. yeah. yeah well yeah. and that's also interesting and i think listen, because you interview so many physicians you'll, you're going to get the gamut of yeah. responses like there yeah. are certainly people who have always wanted to be a doctor since mm-hmm. they were young and always wanted to be you know an oncologist mm-hmm. an OBGYN. i didn't want to be a doctor and when i decided to be a doctor i really thought i would do pediatrics or general surgery because my mm-hmm. parents were a retired general surgeon retired pediatrician so those were what i knew And I certainly could see that pediatrics was a more manageable field if I chose Mm -hmm. to end up having a family, Mm -hmm. whereas general surgery, I loved because I love procedures and Mm -hmm. working with my hands. Mm -hmm. And so I went into medical school saying those were my fields. I truly Mm -hmm. thought gynecology was just disgusting. There was like not even a remote possibility (laughs) until my pre, my, until my rotations. And Mm -hmm. this is what's also, I think, really valuable and important. You could Mm -hmm. go into medicine thinking, you know what you want to do, and you might be right. Some people are lucky and they know. Many of us, I think, don't really know. We base what we think we know on what we've seen through other, Mm -hmm. you know, mentors or whoever. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that you have to be open to be able to um, have things highlighted to you. Mm -hmm. And I had an Mm -hmm. amazing rotation for OBGYN. And those doctors really showed me the beautiful parts of you being Mm -hmm. able as an OBGYN to do surgery, but still do primary care and like bond with our patients through Mm -hmm. all of their life cycles. So I mean, listen, it is, of all the fields, I can honestly say, I think it is the most grueling because it's the only field where you're literally fractured between two worlds and you're Mm -hmm. running between the hospital and the office and surgery and and emergencies and even the most beautiful deliveries. You Mm -hmm. are still at any moment faced with like, you might have a hemorrhage, you might have whatever happens. But I think that to be able to do surgeries, if you like procedures and still have patients be with you forever is an Mm -hmm. amazing thing. Mm -hmm. And no other field Mm -hmm. has that. For sure. From your videos, what I've gathered is, well, 
at least for me, every time someone says OBGYN, OBGYN, it's like a crumple for just OBGYN. Or people just say OB, OB, OB. From your video, so I'm gathering is you say OBGYN. It's like they're two separate oh, things. Right. But it's, really both, it's actually really one important. whole world. Yeah. There's like yeah. the OB part where you help with the pregnant. And then the whole GYN part, which like encompasses anything either that's before or after that right. Um, phenomenon, right? And yeah. it's such an... I mean, I honestly don't think that I could do it. But then again, we don't know until, <laughs> until you rotations. Could. You might not want to do it, but you could, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and I do think, listen, what I think is really important, actually, today marks the day where I made a huge change. And after several months of thinking about it, mm. I stopped seeing gynecology patients in my practice. Mm. And it's really emotional for me today. Yeah. I saw 27 oh. patients. They were all either pregnant or postpartum. I loved every minute yeah. of it, but I really miss my gynecology patients. And I yeah. say all the time, I mean, you spend more time in your life as a gynecology person yes. than as an obstetric person, yeah. A, because some people choose not to have children or can't yeah. have children. And yeah. even if you do get pregnant, you're going to spend more time needing yeah. your gynecological health yeah. to be addressed, which is why yeah. I stopped doing it in the office so that I could focus more like on our online platform on my yeah. tribe called tribe B. but I really urge every human out there with a uterus or ovaries or a vagina to <laughs> find a gynecologist that you really like and you bond with because mm -hmm. you really need to make sure that you feel like they're listening and collaborating so yeah. I think all mm -hmm. too many times people will say no big deal like I'll just you know I'll just go in for my pap smear once a year it's not a big deal yeah. and the answer yeah. is well first of all it's not just your pap smear we're going to talk yeah. about pap smears today but that's not mm -hmm. the most important thing yeah it's one yeah. of many and yeah. you really need a good relationship with your gynecologist mm -hmm. so that if something comes up whether it's obstetric or gynecological you have a relationship where you feel mm -hmm. like they've listened to you and they can collaborate and help you find your way back to being healthy mm -hmm. right no, so I think it's really important. Yeah, I agree with that. And I see we are even closer to the whole pap smear topic. What do you think is the bread and butter of OBGYN in general? If let's say in a clinic, GYN clinic, you walk in today and there, there might be three or five things that for sure you're going to see. What would that be? Just for okay. the general public to know what's for sure. the bread well, and butter of the field. There are a lot, but I will say that mm -hmm. the top things that I wish we talked about more, mm -hmm. and this is what I'm going to talk about more through Tribe <laughs> Called V, and I love these yeah. platforms, HPV and herpes. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I can tell you it is a dime a dozen, and I don't say that to be dismissive. I say that yeah. to all of the men and women out there yeah. who yeah. have HPV and or herpes. Mm -hmm. It's common. We're going to talk about that, but mm -hmm. HPV and herpes are common endometriosis and polycystic mm -hmm. ovarian syndrome mm -hmm. super common and actually probably yeah. very underdiagnosed and very oh, yes. misunderstood oh, so yes. they end up kind of invoking a lot of fear mm -hmm. in women mm -hmm. when in mm -hmm. fact if we talked about it more educated mm -hmm. more people mm -hmm. would be less anxious about it because they'd realize it's actually more common and there's probably yeah. a spectrum and there's probably many people with mm -hmm. kind of milder versions who are okay um yeah. so those four things i would say are huge and then perimenopause perimenopause mm -hmm. is rampant it's a long period in our life mm -hmm. anywhere from starting at like age 38 or 40 through menopause at 50 51 52 and again very misunderstood so the most common things we see are also woefully misunderstood mm -hmm. and then yeast infections and bv bacterial vaginosis and yeast infections are also a dime a dozen so there that was like, what did we just say i don't know i think seven or eight things that are common that we see there we day. go it's 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 a fount of phenomenons yeah. and yeah. incidences and your Two decades of working, people have sent me this question more, of, and they usually send this question with every guest. I think more of like a fun fact kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What do you think is probably hard to choose from? Is there one event that you would say that you will never forget, whether surgically, procedurally, or a consult, the diagnosis, just the one thing that made the most mark on you, whether it's the wildest thing you've seen the scariest thing you've seen oh honey god they're so i mean <laughs> listen i've seen some really scary things i hate saying that so, so let's not talk about the scary things because i think there's a lot of like <laughs> heavy stuff in medicine right now i will tell you one of the funniest things i've seen mm -hmm. truly one of the cutest funniest stories that i still <laughs> love thinking about because it was so fun and belies my point about mm -hmm. herpes and I actually, mm. I really like to talk about herpes and HPV. I joke, it's like my favorite topic. I want to talk about yeah. it casually, openly, frequently to debunk the anxiety, Let's not to it. mitigate the importance. It's important, yeah. but yeah. I don't want it to create fear and anxiety. Yeah. So I was an intern. So it was the end of my first year of the four years of OBGYN residency mm -hmm. that you do. Mm -hmm. And I go downstairs with a second year resident because we have to evaluate a 92 year old woman who had a rash on her vulva. Right. And again, mm -hmm. to remind everyone, your vulva is the outside, so yeah. not inside the vagina, on the outside of the skin. 
And long story short, we go to evaluate her and we determined that it was actually shingles. Now, many of the viewers might know that shingles is chicken pox as a virus that gets triggered and shows up with these little blisters. And this sweet, cute, 90 something year old woman, we described to her what it was. And she goes, I can't believe with this adorable New York accent, I can't believe I got chicken pox on my twat. <laughs> and the way she said twat, which you, do you know that twat is like slang for your vagina and yep. your vulva. So the way she said it, the other resident and I were like, oh my God, we need to just chuckle and laugh out loud because this woman, and she said it completely straight face. And I thought, oh my God, oh, I get to do this every day oh where I get to like take care of these ladies and they get to tell me all kinds of funny things. And so there we go. I, there we go. So I'd rather talk about the funny stuff than all the, because oh we see God. a lot of dramatic, nerve wracking things. Oh, we do. Stuff. Yes, we do. Yeah. But I must say though, it's usually our geriatric patients who make us laugh the most. Yeah, I yeah, must, yeah. Say. Yeah. I must yeah, say. And usually has to do a lot with the GYN aspect, even in my cardiac unit, I was very yep. as well. Oh my gosh, that's funny. It's no longer October, but let me tell you a horror story. I was working bedside as a nurse. 12 hour shifts, 12,000 to 15,000 steps per night, always exposed to dripping blood, pee, and other fluids. And guess what? I was wearing skateboarding shoes for almost a year. Because my feet were killing me, I switched to more comfortable sneakers that had to go through three pairs because I would find new stains after shifts. And over time, as the pandemic came, I was too exhausted to think about my feet or even changing my footwear. I was then introduced to Clove, and I no longer had to do the thinking. To support the steps of those who dedicate their lives to caring for others, Clove collaborated with healthcare professionals and innovative designers to create a shoe that prioritizes the needs of those in the front line. These are sneakers designed for healthcare. They already did the thinking. Easy to clean and fluid repellent, I no longer have to worry about those red streaks or pea-soaked socks since I use the same wipes at work to remove every stain. Just this summer, one of my patients unexpectedly bled from the radial artery access site and made a pool in my brilliant whites on the floor. A few swipes with the purple wipes, all clean and with no damage. Plus being squeak free, I no longer have to worry about waking up a sleeping patient. Layered with comfort, sore toes are no longer my problem since the shoes are now upgraded with double the cushioning, 50% more arch support, and a perfect heel pad. On top of this, the grippiest outsole also allows for a fluid channel technology while maintaining super secure footing. And yes, it's 100% cruelty free and vegan. I love all of my clove shoes and I hope that you can get ready to also step into your perfect pair. Use code FRANZ, that's F-R-A-N-Z, or visit goclove.com slash friends for 15% off your first pair of clove shoes at checkout. I am no stranger to seeing patients that can't get the care they need because they can't afford it. Even if they get a medical recommendation that will help them, oftentimes, medication costs are so high it's totally out of reach, or they would have to choose between feeding their family or paying rent in order to get the medication, so people have to go without. After living through a pandemic, on some level, we all know the healthcare system in the United States is broken. That is why I am happy to see that mission-driven businesses are now taking an interest in the problem because it's not getting solved fast enough. Better Remedies is one of those companies doing something to really meaningfully help people with medical expenses, in particular, getting their medications. Better makes over-the-counter medication, think pain, gas, cough and flu, sleep, all the essentials for your medicine cabinet. For every box of Better Remedies sold, they cover the cost of someone's life-saving medication for a month. And this is someone who would otherwise have to choose between food, rent, gas to get to work, or otherwise caring for themselves or their family. It is such an easy switch to make. You get the same great relief you need for 10% less than other big name brands, and someone who doesn't have the access to their meds will get the help they need. In general, it's good to know the active ingredients you need for your symptoms rather than just buying a big name brand. It'll save you money, and because active ingredients are FDA regulated, you'll still be getting the results you need. Plus, if you buy from Better, you are also helping someone else in a big way too. It's putting your headaches, farts, and insomnia to work. And that's something we can all feel better about. I've been buying my Better Remedies products at Walmart at any time I need to stock up. And you can do the same. Everything is priced about 10% less than the big brands, works just as well, and makes an impact on something that is really important and that I am personally very passionate about. Make the switch next time you need relief. You'll feel better and be doing some good. Dark January. 
Cervical Health Awareness Month. I don't have a cervix, <laughs> so uh, I've only taken OB back way back in nursing school. Had my own rotation and OB for seen some vaginal births and C sections. Yes, yes. But in this field, we have masters and experts, and you are one of them. And you have trained and educated in this field for so long, and I think it's one of the fields for some reason, though. Every field has a fan of misinformation. There's something about OBGYN that's like yeah. flooded with misinformation. Probably the demographic, pregnant women are nervous or scared. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's easy to stumble upon any type of information in the internet or on paper. Mm-hmm. And I think this concept of prevention, this primary health, right? Mm-hmm. Primary prevention is something that's a very, very big struggle for every field in medicine yeah. and healthcare. Yeah. For some reason, it's like the first barrier that sometimes we really cannot come across. And right. it can be met with resistance, with hesitancy, or just pure rejection. What are the biggest misconceptions that you have seen and heard with your own ears and eyes or have read through the internet that have frustrated you the most within the concept of cervical health as someone who knows the truth anatomically and physiologically behind the topic? Well, so first to address that, I mean, one of the biggest reasons I think OBGYN has this struggle with misinformation and disinformation Mm -hmm is because at the core of it, when you think about it, women have been demeaned for mm, centuries yes. in every in every part yes. of our world, I right? Agree. I agree. Particularly in medicine, where there's been I a very agree. paternalistic, yeah. like, honey, you're mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. And so in order to combat that, there's mm-hmm. the whole notion that we need to empower ourselves with education, which I applaud, except that it unfortunately ends up backfiring on women often. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. in an effort to educate themselves, they unfortunately have to hear so many different answers mm-hmm. that aren't necessarily always learned in school. So that's, yeah. I think, the reason why it just leads to this information. I agree. Okay, so the biggest misconceptions, I think, with HPV actually have to do, like with anything else in medicine, with fear, right? Mm-hmm. So some of the statistics that are really important for everyone to know. HPV, which is human papilloma virus, affects, and when I say affects, meaning 80 to 90% of us on this earth, men, women, regardless of sexual, sexual status as far as who you're having sex with or how often you've had sex, you will be exposed to the HPV virus. And it's really important to know that because in the past, and sometimes the textbooks will still kind of talk about, you know, promiscuity increases the Mm -hmm. chance. But Mm -hmm. the truth is, again, you could have had sex with one person in your life Mm -hmm. with a condom the entire time. And because the HPV virus will live on the skin outside of the condom, Mm -hmm. so on the vulva, below the Mm -hmm. shaft of the penis, Mm -hmm. you can get exposed to it. So Mm -hmm. we really should stray from the notion that if you have HPV, it means you've been promiscuous because that word is so, first of all, old fashioned and fraught with, judgment, right? It has nothing to do with how many sexual partners you had. It merely has to do with, it is a virus that lives all over the skin. So if you have sex, you have to accept that this is what might come with it. And I actually, I used to use my car analysis for this, which is if you drive a car, you have to accept certain amounts of risk and you're going to mitigate mm-hmm. your risk by you mm-hmm. know, putting on your seatbelt and not texting and not being drunk. But then you have to accept that you still might get into a car accident. Yeah. And the same thing with sex. If mm-hmm. you have sex, it's good to use condoms to prevent any transmission. And if you're having female, female sex, you can consider using a dental dam. Mm. It's good to also then acknowledge that you cannot prevent everything. And so getting HPV or herpes, which are both viruses that live on the skin, is something that just comes along with having sex. Mm -hmm. And the more you learn Mm -hmm. about it, the less devastated you could be. Mm -hmm. Now I've found that I could actually draw the analogy with COVID. Same thing with COVID. You and I Mm -hmm. have been vaccinated Mm -hmm. and boosted because we're going to talk about the HPV vaccine. And we use our masks. So we use a barrier Mm -hmm. method. And yet that virus lives all over the place. We wash our hands. We wear our barrier. But just like vaccinating with HPV and (laughs) using condoms, that virus is everywhere. So we have to be adults about it. We have to accept that we still might get it. And when we do get it, we have to be calm and we need Mm -hmm. to take the measures that we can to keep Mm -hmm. ourselves healthy despite getting the virus. Mm -hmm. So again, that's true with with HPV and now with COVID. So the biggest misconception again is, first of all, it's so incredibly common. And so the misconception becomes, A, that it means something dirty or wrong or embarrassing, which it doesn't. 80 to 90% of us have it. It's not dirty or wrong or embarrassing. And then the second layer is that despite it being so common, it invokes so much fear. I mean, people literally are like, oh my God, I have HPV. And I mean, I try to be really jokey about it and be like, listen, I mean, the fact that you got through your life without HPV is actually (laughs) a coup. Um, The other misconceptions are that many people, men and women, have HPV and don't know it. 
First of all, because you can have normal pap smears that even show up with HPV negative and you still can have HPV because it can live at low levels and not show up on our test. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But that means you think you don't have it. One year you show up with it. And in your mind, you think it means infidelity when in reality, it means that it could have lived there for decades. So that's the one important thing. The second important thing is that men have no test for HPV. So if a man says to his partner or her partner, to his female or male partner, oh, I don't have HPV. The honest answer is he doesn't know because he has no pap smear equivalent. There's no blood test and he won't have had any symptoms of HPV. So that's another huge misconception that happens. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think if we could just debunk those alone, that like, yes, you can still get it with condoms. And by the way, 80 to 90 percent of us carry it and men can't get tested for Mm -hmm. it unless they happen to have had warts. That's the only way they would know they have Mm -hmm. one strain, Mm -hmm. one kind of category of Mm -hmm. HPV. The other biggest part is keeping in mind that statistically, even if you have HPV, it's very unlikely you're going to have cervical cancer. So it's really good for us to be vigilant and aware of it so that we can help prevent it. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of people in America are never going to have cervical cancer because we screen for it through the pap smear test. Yeah. Right. There we go. Yeah. And I agree with you, Doc, that by breaking down the stigmas first, I feel Mm -hmm. like there's more, it's kind of like in drama, like breaking that fourth wall, making people more open to receiving information like these. So then, as you have said, doesn't mean that you have HPV, does not mean that it will lead to cervical cancer, right? But based on data, what is the correlation between HPV risk or HPV infection, actually infected with it, and the actual rise of malignant cervical cancer? I mean, luckily, so we know that HPV happens to live most in the cervix, Mm -hmm. but we should also know that HPV can also live in the head and neck. Mm -hmm. So we get that from oral sex and even in the rectum. So Mm -hmm. we're going to talk about vaccines in a minute, I think, but so HPV can infect those areas. And Mm -hmm. when I say infect, that just means you got exposed to it and Mm -hmm. it was there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't affect most of us. So again, the majority of us will have HPV Mm -hmm. and we either only know it because someone told us that they had it, like a a girlfriend tells us or a boyfriend tells us, or we know we have it because our pap smear shows up with HPV, Mm -hmm. but that still does not mean that HPV is going to lead to cervical cancer because HPV, Mm -hmm. I describe it like this. It's very smart because it Mm -hmm. infects 80 to 90% of us, but Mm -hmm. it's very stupid in that it's very slow to change mm-hmm. the cells in the cervix. Mm-hmm. So the way the HPV works is it invades into the, the cells of the cervix and it basically changes them to become irregular cells. But it's mm-hmm. a very slow continuum and it's a very predictable course. Mm-hmm. So it'll go from normal to slightly abnormal to a little bit more abnormal to a little bit more abnormal and then to mm-hmm. cancer. And that can take five to 20 yeah. years. Yes. So yeah. we have the latitude of waiting and watching. We have the latitude of telling people don't smoke because smoking increases the Mm -hmm. virus's ability to do bad things. We can say, let's wait and watch. And if your body has a strong immune system, it will regress the changes Mm -hmm. from the HPV back to normal. So again, even if you get called that you have an abnormal pap smear and that you need to go to the doctor to do the microscope test, that colposcopy Mm -hmm. that women have to have done, the likelihood of that meaning you have cancer is incredibly small. And the likelihood of that meaning that you'll ever develop cancer is equally Mm -hmm. incredibly small because Mm -hmm. your doctor will see changes. And if those changes are aggressive, she'll remove the changes before they've turned into something. Mm -hmm. So really, really the majority of people that we see who get cervical cancer nowadays are either catching it very early or they are actually the ones who haven't necessarily been screened and watched. So we still see it a lot in other countries where they don't have robust screening programs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so we see, if we were talking about the regression of the potential change from HPV and the course that it takes to become cervical cancer mm-hmm. or to actually infect and affect the person, which can take some time. But I feel like the root of all of this is that we can actually even prevent the whole timeline, the whole course, right? Yeah. And and what we do have is the HPV vaccines. and. Yeah. As the expert, can you please talk about yeah. that and what's the whole mechanism behind this? Does it work like every other vaccine in its purpose? I mean, yes and no, right? We know that the way mm-hmm. generally vaccines work is that they introduce something to your system yeah. so that your body creates antibodies mm-hmm. against it, right? So in that way, yes. Mm-hmm. HPV, so I'm going to give you a little bit of vernacular. So HPV is a broad category of tons, like mm-hmm. dozens, if not hundreds of strains of HPV. And it's broken down into two broad categories. Sadly, they chose to name these categories 
high risk HPV and low risk HPV. Mm-hmm. Low risk HPV causes warts by and large, which are not dangerous. They're just unsightly. They're annoying. We don't like them. They can be on your vulva, on your cervix, on your rectum, but they're not dangerous. So that's mm-hmm. low risk HPV. Mm-hmm. The other broad category is high risk HPV, poorly named because it implies to the patient that it is at high risk that you're going to have cancer when you're not. It just really means that those are the strains, again, of which there are dozens, if not hundreds Mm -hmm. of strains Mm -hmm. that might lead to cervical, rectal, and then oral Mm -hmm. cancer. And Mm -hmm. so those high risk strains are the ones that we really care about most. Mm -hmm. When you get the HPV vaccine, the first vaccine, which came out 15-ish years ago, was only four strains of the virus. And it was Mm -hmm. two that caused the high risk and two that Mm -hmm. were the low risk. Now the newer one is nine strains and it's called Gardasil because it guards against HPV, but it's only nine strains. So first of all, that means just like the COVID vaccine, you're not going to get 100% protection. You're going to get protection against those nine strains. Mm -hmm. Your best protection Mm -hmm. would be getting the vaccine young before you have had any sex, including oral sex, Mm -hmm. because you'd like to try to avoid it in your throat. So Mm -hmm. to all the parents of young girls and boys, because both are getting vaccinated nowadays, because we know that we're getting it from each other. Mm -hmm. The best thing to do is get them vaccinated young. I mean, they're starting really young. I would say to many moms and dads, like if you want to wait till your children are 13, 14, 15, rather Mm -hmm. than 11, I understand that. But you have to keep in mind that children are sexually active, sometimes at Mm -hmm. younger ages, even though we don't Mm -hmm. like to talk about it, but we should talk about it more openly. And so getting the Gardasil vaccine is the first step at decreasing the chance. It will not eliminate it. It'll just decrease Mm -hmm. the chance Mm -hmm. of those nine strains in particular. Second is being judicious and using condoms, because even though it doesn't 100% to you know, prevent it, it really will minimize the chance. Yeah. And then the third and honestly, almost most important is preemptively teaching our young people before they've had sex, that it is okay to have sex if you are in mature enough to understand what it means mm-hmm. physically and emotionally. And if you're in a respectful relationship, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. that is different age for everyone, obviously, but <laughs> embarking on that is okay. As long as you understand what it entails. I have many young women who, when I talk about HPV before they've had sex, their response is, oh, I would be devastated. That would be horrible. And I always say, listen, if you're going to be devastated by it, that's okay. But that might be a sign that you're not yet ready to have sex. And that's okay mm-hmm. too. Even if you're 18 or 19, if this would lead to devastation, then do not embark on this adult endeavor. Just like if you said to me, oh my God, I'd be devastated to have COVID. I'm going to say, all right, then, then don't leave the house. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, also make sure you get vaccinated and wear your mask, yeah. right? So I'm going to say the same thing about, about Gardasil. Get mm-hmm. your vaccine, use your condoms, be judicious mm-hmm. about not exposing yourself too much, but don't have sex unless you're willing to accept that you mm-hmm. still might get HPV and you likely will not get cervical cancer, or if you do, you'll catch it early. Yeah. So many great points there, Doc. I remember in high school, um, they were already talking about like the HPV vaccines. Mm-hmm. And I remember it's always been a talk that, oh, you think the girls got it? You think the girls got it? You think our yeah. female classmates got it? And unknowingly, when both males and females, both boys and the girls, can actually get HPV. And yeah. the second great point that you made is that there's no, and I can vouch for this, there's no 100% in medicine. <laughs> there is yeah. no 100 I wish, right? <laughs> We'd have right, so many, right? there's no. have less problems if there was 100% yeah. of things in medicine. Yeah. But even that high percentage of chance of protection is what we need to safeguard ourselves and the people yeah. around us, right? Yeah. And I also love how you bring out the whole psychosocial aspect of embarking on this journey. And there are a lot of risks involved, but amazing medicine and medical technology, right? That we have all of these modalities that we have that can help us prevent sickness and prevent infection and even have tests that we can have so that we can screen things and foresee things like the pap smear, right? Um, And Doc, can you please talk about what's the pap smear? Well, and the pap smear, I have to say, is an amazing thing. Thankfully, Mm -hmm. a Greek doctor years ago developed, Dr. Papa Nicola Mm -hmm. developed it where it was, Mm -hmm. it's like, I actually have my little model that I use a lot. So this is is an IUD model, but let's say the doctor puts the speculum into the vagina and then Mm -hmm. looks at the cervix. That's the opening of the cervix. And then she'll take a little swab of the cells on the cervix. But the idea being that the HPV lives mostly in that outside part of the cervix. So if we swab it, Um, We used to do it with a wooden spatula and we had to spray a slide. Luckily, in the last two decades, we have liquid based. So they'll use a very soft brush with a speculum, which is not a clamp. I always say it kind of gently goes into the vagina, opens, takes about five to 10 seconds to get a swab of those cervical cells and sends them to the lab 
to look for the abnormal changes from the HPV virus. Mm -hmm. The great news is that it's ever evolving. The complicated news is that it's ever evolving. And so our pap smear guidelines change. They are very confusing. It used to be a much more standard, mm -hmm. like you got a pap smear every year. And now you, I could not say to any one person, this is how often you will always need your pap smear because it's based on your risk factors, mm -hmm. like your immune compromised status, things like whether or not you've had an abnormal pap smear in the past and your age. And so each person will have kind of a different guideline with regard to how often they need their mm -hmm. pap smear. We each, actually, most of us as doctors now have an app on our phone mm. where we plug in your stats. Like if you're 25 and this is your first pap smear versus if you're 21 versus if you're 32, mm -hmm. what was your last pap smear? How long ago was it? Because it's that complicated. In mm -hmm. general, I can say to people, okay, you will need your pap smear anywhere from one to five years apart. Mm -hmm. Many doctors will still do it yearly, frankly, because it's actually easier to remember because mm -hmm. many patients mm -hmm. mistakenly think that if they need their pap smear only every three to five years, that they don't need to see the doctor anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. But the confusing part is if you do it every year and you're actually probably getting over tested in a yeah. way that you don't necessarily need. So there is a conundrum and we run into that problem all the time in our practice where mm -hmm. patients want to do it every year or it's easier for us to do it every year because they're there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's confusing. And so suffice yeah. to say, you should talk to your doctor about not only when to start, but how often to do it. Mm -hmm. Right now, the American College of OBGYN recommends starting at 21 and then mm -hmm. doing it every one to five years, again, depending on your age. But the American Cancer Society guidelines are actually different. And they say you could start mm -hmm. at 25 and mm -hmm. only test for HPV, not even test for the cells of the cervix. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a very nuanced conversation that's very yeah. complicated. But to yeah. simplify it and nugget it down, I would talk to your doctor starting at 21 and then decide with your doctor if you're going to get your pap smear. And then every one to five years, you'll need either a pap smear alone where they look at your cells or a pap smear where they also look at HPV, depending mm -hmm. on what your status was in your last pap smear. Mm -hmm. We don't look for HPV until women turn 30, as it is right mm -hmm. now, unless the cells in their cervix were actually abnormal. And so that makes mm -hmm. it even more confusing because many mm -hmm. young women under age 30 think they don't have HPV yeah. because their pap smear was normal. Yeah. But that just yeah. means that our algorithm doesn't tell us to look for the virus until age 30 mm -hmm. because it's so ubiquitous. And we actually don't yeah. want to know in most women because mm -hmm. it's not going to cause mm -hmm. harm if they're mm -hmm. otherwise healthy. Got it. That Got it. Sense? Yeah. I was going through TikTok the other week and I mm -hmm. feel like TikTok found out that I was talking to an OBGYN expert <laughs> and yeah. there was a video about different speculums and yeah. It's probably more visceral for the women, yeah. but how viable are the fears of women just getting their pap yeah. smear for the very first really time? Yeah. yeah. I mean, listen, I say all the time to my first time patients, my goal is to make this exam as, as least uncomfortable as mm -hmm. possible mm -hmm. so that while you'll never look forward to your pap smear, you still yeah. love coming to see me every year and mm -hmm. you don't dread it because it's really yeah. important to have a relationship again with someone who you feel yeah. like is respecting you. And imagine, yeah. imagine yeah. if men had to go through this. It's so vulnerable. You're yeah. lying there, right? You're exposed. You're uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, everything about it is really not great, yeah. but I think we can, we can do a good job as the practitioners mm -hmm. in trying to mm -hmm. make women feel comfortable. I mean, mm -hmm. I always joke with my patients, I'll never say relax. Mm -hmm. I'll never say relax mm -hmm. your legs because you cannot relax when you're there. And I think that's yeah. very triggering. And I think it's just yeah. demeaning. I'll always yeah. kind of euphemize and say, let your legs stay floppy because mm -hmm. if they're a little bit less tense, it makes mm -hmm. it easier for the doctor to do what she needs to do quickly, mm -hmm. gently, and effectively. The mm -hmm. speculum, again, I always say this to the young patients, remind them it is not a clamp. Again, it goes in and opens. <laughs> there's actually a really yeah. wonderful, I wish I had an example up here, but there's a, an Iranian engineer who created a mm -hmm. new speculum that is actually smaller. Seen, Have you seen that? It's I think amazing. I've seen that one, yeah. It's so good. And I really hope that we kind of widespread adopt it. The only, mm -hmm. the rate limiting step is just the cost to begin with, mm -hmm. but over time mm -hmm. it would actually mm -hmm. be less expensive for doctors to use it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's a really valid concern. And I think that Doctors who kind of treat it like, oh, it's not a big deal. Just, you know, get mm -hmm. on the table and I'll do the pap smear mm -hmm. are doing a disservice to that woman for her mm -hmm. entire life because now it's mm -hmm. creating an, an anxiety in her every time she goes mm -hmm. to the doctor and we don't want that. Mm -hmm. And there's ways to make it better. And so I think mm -hmm. that those of us who try really hard feel like we know that there are ways to help women feel more comfortable so that they're excited to go to the doctor just mm -hmm. to connect and talk. Right. Definitely. And, you know, like I said, I feel like we're at a generation in time where 
so fortunate that we do have these modalities of both prevention and screening to mm-hmm. find out if something's wrong that we can prevent any things that can go wrong. But unfortunately, as with everything in healthcare and medicine, some things don't go right. <laughs> and so many results don't come out pleasurable and right. as expected. Crossing that primary prevention stage where you've done your prevent stuff you've gotten screened but in the instances of still getting hpv uh, yep. or getting those abnormal um results of the pap yep. smear i can just imagine how downtrodden someone can feel and afraid mm-hmm. obviously as a practitioner what is your job from that point like obviously you've been there from the beginning but how do you change your presence for them in this trajectory of for them it might seem downhill but for you obviously you've seen this again and again and again what are the next steps for these people yeah okay so i'm so glad you mentioned about screening because i think it's a really good opportunity for us to teach everybody that screening is a very specific word that we use that a lot of people don't patients don't realize the definition, right? A screening test is meant to be a test that can easily be done, is affordable to be done, can be extrapolated Mm -hmm. to the Mm -hmm. masses, can be Mm -hmm. interpreted and can find a disease state in the early, Mm -hmm. early, early times. Mm -hmm. So when you go in for screening by definition, right, you have no symptoms. Mm -hmm. You're not going for your pap smear because you have a problem. You're going for your pap smear yearly or every couple of years as a screening test with no symptoms. The minute your pap smear comes back irregular and then your doctor will let you know what your next step is, then it becomes a diagnostic test. So the step yeah. after the abnormal screening pap smear is the diagnostic step, mm-hmm. meaning the screening pap smear is meant, like any other screening test, to have a really high false positive rate. It's sure. meant to say, oh, yeah. you had something irregular. We're not saying there's something wrong. We're just saying it's mm-hmm. irregular and we have to look further. We're going to look further with this diagnostic test. And then we're going to decide what to do. And that Mm -hmm. diagnostic test is called the colposcopy, which again Mm -hmm. means Mm -hmm. microscope, basically, in Mm -hmm. Latin of the cervix, colpo means Mm -hmm. cervix. So we look at the cervix with this little microscope. We use this vinegary-like solution, acetic acid, to kind of bathe the cervix to help bring out some changes. And then we take little samples. I actually try not to use the word biopsy because patients get very triggered by that word. But the truth is these are tiny one to two, one to three millimeter little biopsies. So I say, we're going to look, we're going to take some samples of the outside part of the cervix and of the inside canal of the cervix, because those are the places where the HPV can reside and cause Mm -hmm. changes. And that diagnostic test then is going to help the doctor say, oh, look, yes, you had an abnormal pap smear. But your colposcopy, your diagnostic test, showed minimal changes. There's basically three levels of changes, essentially. So to make it more digestible for patients, I'll say there's, you know, mild, moderate, or severe. We don't exactly use that vernacular anymore, but it's helpful for them to understand it. And mild changes, we leave alone because your body will help regress them back to normal, Mm -hmm. especially, Mm -hmm. again, if you don't smoke Mm -hmm. and if you keep your immune system strong. Mm -hmm. And then if they're moderate or severe, then you and your doctor decide together what is going to happen next? Are you going to have further surveillance or are you going to have that procedure called a cone biopsy where the doctor would remove a tiny little part of the cervix right there that's kind of in a cone shape to help remove the damaged part so that you don't progress into cervical mm-hmm. cancer. But again, the stepwise changes are, are so slow. Like let's say you have an abnormal pap smear today. You don't even need to come in to have the colposcopy, potentially at all, depending on your age mm-hmm. and your last pap smear. But again, not for several months or weeks potentially, then once you had the colposcopy, even if it was very irregular, it would take 5, 15, 20 years Mm -hmm. potentially for it to turn into Mm -hmm. cancer. So while my resounding message to women is please get your pap smear done and take it seriously, it's because we're able to prevent cervical cancer by prevention, like you said, vaccine, wearing a condom when you can, and then just getting screened. Right. And I think the biggest part is keeping calm about it. So I think as the doctor, my job is to inform my patients, but help diffuse their anxiety Mm -hmm. enough that they don't come in with fear, that they instead Mm -hmm. say, okay, I'm really, you know, I say to them, nerves are normal, but don't be Mm -hmm. scared. Come in, tell me you're anxious. I get it. But please don't be scared because the likelihood of this being cancer or something that we cannot fix is very small. Having worked as a nurse in cardiac surgery recovery and outpatient interventional cardiology, I learned that listening is a vital part of the field. But beyond listening to what patients say, it is also important to hear what they don't say. And many times, you can hear this in the stillness and quietness of the room as their chest thumps and rhythms that can range from normalcy to urgency. A person's heartbeat is not only a sign of life, but also a sign of its quality. 
According to the CDC, arrhythmias, or abnormal heart sounds, have an expected prevalence of about 1.5% in the general population, with atrial fibrillation being the most common. This is why it is so important that we can adequately hear and detect heart and even lung sounds that may be detrimental to human life. ECHO provides smart digital stethoscopes, such as the 3M Letman Core Digital Stethoscope, that help you check for signs of heart and lung disease in seconds during physical exams with unprecedented enhanced stethoscope sound and automated detection. This is all through a quick pairing with your mobile device. This is made possible by features such as having up to 40 times amplification, active noise cancellation, wireless listening, auto-triggered heart murmur and atrial fibrillation detection, and real-time visualization of sound and ECG that you can share as a consult with a trusted colleague or specialist. Every patient encounter deserves exceptional care. Hear clearly and care confidently with ECHO. The virtual space is flooded with so many different brands, resources, and gears made for healthcare workers from all disciplines. From scrubs to pins and even compression talks, it can truly get overwhelming trying to find the best product fit for you. Links to these items can get lost, and the list can get so long that you forget what you actually needed to purchase for your next work shift. This is why I am so grateful to partner with Lumify, the community marketplace for healthcare workers all in one app. Finding the brands you love, discovering new tools, and accessing your resources and communities shouldn't be difficult. Instead of going to 50 different websites to access what you need, you can find it all on Lumify where over 200 brands, organizations, and resources are united with one goal, to support healthcare workers. As a nurse-founded company, Lumify believes that all healthcare professionals deserve a trusting and supportive community of their peers. In Lumify, you can easily communicate with your peers to trade advice, share product recommendations, and discuss what resources are best to support you. You can even earn Lumify points on every purchase you complete, which you can save for product discounts. Whether it's mental health resources, or fluid-resistant shoes, hi Clove, or stethoscopes, hi Echo, or podcast, welcome to France of France, Lumify is trusted by over 75,000 healthcare professionals at the bedside and beyond, including myself. Enter this new healthcare ecosystem where you can get 10% off using the code Lumify Friends. That's L-U-M-I-F-Y-F-R-A-N-Z at LumifyCare.com or the Lumify app available for download on iOS devices. It's a one-stop shop, and I hope you drop by. There are other things that women might be worried about if normal result comes like in or they get HPV or even things like, can I get pregnant? Yeah, will this, yes. Will this I mean, be a problem for my menstrual cycle or this or that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so so you can absolutely get pregnant with HPV because again, 80 to 90% of us carry it. Millions yeah. of us have yeah. it. It does not affect yeah. the pregnancy at all. It does not affect your menstrual cycle at all. Mm-hmm. In other words, mm-hmm. there's nothing about HPV that will change your cycle other than the stress involved with HPV, which stress can change your menstrual mm-hmm. cycle, right? I want to talk a little bit about symptoms because again, many mm-hmm. patients will Google, <laughs> they've had some irregular bleeding, they Google it, and they're like, I'm dying of cervical cancer. Now, WebMD. <laughs> WebMD. Is one symptom of cervical cancer irregular cervical vaginal bleeding? Yes. But the truth is, that's when it's pretty far gone. So in patients mm-hmm. who have been getting pap smears at mm-hmm. one to five year intervals and seeing their doctor, the likelihood of them presenting with bleeding as cervical cancer is very small. The vast mm-hmm. majority of patients in America, in the screened population who are mm-hmm. showing up at their doctor regularly, if they're going to mm-hmm. have cervical cancer, it's going to be a very controlled, I saw your pap smear, your pap mm-hmm. smear is irregular. We did the mm-hmm. colposcopy. We saw some aggressive changes. We removed those changes. And lo mm-hmm. and behold, there was a small cancer. That's mm-hmm. going to be the continuum. And those patients, especially if they have not yet had children, would see a specialist, sometimes a GYN oncologist or sometimes mm-hmm. a generalist, who would do a small enough cone biopsy to preserve the fertility in the future. Mm-hmm. And often that cone biopsy is done not because of cancer, but because of, again, mm-hmm. the changes that we don't want to yeah. turn into cancer. Yeah. And women can absolutely get pregnant after that and be yeah. okay. So, yeah. you know, it's interesting. I, I remember years ago, one of my patients didn't come in for her follow-up and I called and I was like, honey, you were supposed to come in for your colposcopy. And she goes, well, you kind of like comforted me so much. You made it seem like I was okay that I didn't come in. And I said, <laughs> okay, well, let me be clear. I am very comforting about things that I can find and fix, but I can mm-hmm. only be comforting if you help me find and fix them, right? I can't yeah. sit here, unicorns and rainbows, and act like no one's going to get cervical cancer. I have yeah. to say, you are likely not going to get cervical cancer if you take these risk reduction measures. Yeah. Get vaccinated. Try to be judicious. Make sure you see your doctor. And if you have yeah. an abnormal half smear, have your follow-up, right? Yeah. 
So, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but also beyond the screenings, pap smears, and vaccines, I feel like we also have a lot of, I feel like what we see in textbooks, right? Modifiable, non-modifiable factors when it comes to every pathophysiology. What is the importance of diet and lifestyle when it comes to probably the body's vulnerability to HPV or even cervical cancer in itself and even genetics in itself that we can't even have influence about? Okay. So genetics are a great question because as it stands right now, we don't think there's any genetic components to cervical mm, cancer. Mm -hmm, Unlike mm. breast, ovarian, colon, uterine, melanoma, pancreatic, mm. and prostate, which are increasingly found to be potentially mm. related to family history. Mm -hmm. When someone says to me, my mother or my grandmother had cervical cancer, that's just related to HPV. Now, mm. are there some multifactorial genetic things that predispose any of us to having a weaker immune system? Maybe, but there's no one gene for cervical cancer at mm -hmm. all. Getting back to the other question about what are the modifiable things, like the clearly modifiable, one clearly modifiable thing is smoking. We know for a fact that nicotine mm -hmm. allows the HPV virus to cause more harm. So absolutely, mm -hmm. it's one more reason to quit smoking, right? And mm -hmm. we know that, for example, people who have HIV, who are severely immune compromised, mm -hmm. are more at risk for cervical cancer mm -hmm. because they have HPV at the same rate as the rest of us. Their mm -hmm. body is less able to kind of fight that well. So mm -hmm. as far as lifestyle, I would say, listen, in general, I think lifestyle is one of those tricky businesses where we really want to encourage people to live healthily and live good lifestyles. Yeah. But like you and I abuse our bodies daily by working yeah. so much and not yeah. necessarily getting all the sleep. And so mm. I think we have to approach it carefully and cautiously. I think we have to encourage people, try to keep your immune system as strong as you can. We know that mm -hmm. good nutrition is important, which like I fail at all the time because I love food, yeah. right? But obviously eating a lot in abundance <laughs> of like vegetables and fruits, yeah. trying to get sleep. And frankly, mm -hmm. having a good attitude like that alone mm -hmm. is like yeah. having an optimistic attitude of gratitude is really going to help you. All of that said, there is still a chance that despite that, your immune system doesn't fight the virus as well as it should. And I never want lifestyle to kind of cause people to feel angst and guilt over getting something, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was one thing that they're starting to look at. There is actually a mushroom complex called AHCC. Um, mm -hmm. It's an acronym I that, that yeah. I don't remember what. Yeah. I think I think it has um, maybe lion's mane and a few different mushrooms because mm -hmm. we know from good mm -hmm. data, Western scientific, mm -hmm. you know, study data that certain mushroom complexes really can have antiviral and anti-cancer mm -hmm. benefits. So yeah, they and have actually, studied... I just see. Yeah, someone just asked if there's any supplements that we recommend. Oh yeah, yeah. So AHCC is the acronym, mm -hmm. and you can buy it like you know on any big box mm -hmm. store. My concern with with encouraging people to take it is that it's not cheap. I mean, one month mm -hmm. is like 30 to $50. So mm -hmm. I do have patients where if they've had persistent HPV for a while, which is where we mm -hmm. worry a little bit more, um, or they're just tired of having to keep coming in for their abnormalities. Mm -hmm. I'll say, listen, one thing you can do besides the other stuff of like just trying to be healthy is take AHCC. Mm -hmm. And I would say anecdotally, some of my patients like it because it feels like they're mm -hmm. doing something and they have mm -hmm. noticed some regression. And there is good actual data about this. And mm -hmm. this again, Mm -hmm. I love integrative stuff, but this is not even integrative. This is Western studied yeah. randomized yeah. trials. Yeah. So AHCC, but again, I don't want everyone to run out and buy it because it's not cheap. <laughs> yeah. It's not cheap. Yeah. So I was asking if B12 was useful. You know, there have been studies about things like folic acid and the B vitamins, mm -hmm. but nothing mm -hmm. conclusive. So again, I think that the B vitamins are pretty harmless. You don't want to overload yourself on any vitamin if you don't need it. But I think mm -hmm. if, you're, if your B12 is low normal or just in the mm -hmm. mid-range of normal, you certainly can take B12 and folic acid. Mm -hmm. Those are important for us to take anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you no, know, I just love all of these education that we've been doing about cervical health. And thank you so much for providing us with your wisdom about it. And I think this is the main goal of your tribe called V, right? Yeah. Where this resource for amazing resource for everybody. If you could just tell us about it. Stop. Yeah. Um, well, actually, someone had a question about, do I recommend the vaccine after having HPV? And the answer is yes, because the vaccine mm -hmm. guards against nine strains. And even mm -hmm. if you have HPV, you may know a couple of your strains, but mm -hmm. you won't know all of them. Um, but yeah, so Tribe Called V. So I started it with my business partner, Jenny Hayes Edwards, because initially she approached me and said, I want to get pregnant and I want us to create a pregnancy course which was great. I was like, I'm all for that. I don't know how to do it, but I know, I know about pregnancy and she knew how to create the course. So we actually, during COVID, anytime we weren't both working, which was not a lot of times, we would spend time on Sundays in our little studio here. And so she's actually editing our pregnancy course. She's now had her baby. Um, she was 45 when she had a baby. 
So we, we go through everything during that course. So that is being edited as we speak. But now we started a pregnancy program. So patients and women throughout the country who are not my patients show up twice a month for our Zooms and their members, they get an ebook that we wrote. And then we talk about all the pregnancy things. And now that I've decreased my office load, I'm really going to build up the content about the gynecology, which I think, I don't want to say it's more important than pregnancy, but in a way, again, it's more important than pregnancy. And it's purposely things like this. Like I'm going to have, you know, three-part series on HPV or on herpes mm-hmm. or on perimenopause, all the things that really should not yeah. cause the disproportionate amount yeah. of anxiety that they cause. It causes so much angst among women. And it's unfortunate. It's because they yeah. don't get the education and there's no way to educate them other yeah. than in these venues, because the teachers yeah. don't necessarily know the information. The mothers don't even know the information and the doctors don't have time. We just don't yeah. have time to educate, it's right? Time. We are yeah. triaging problems without having time to preemptively educate. And so I'm yeah. a I'm a huge fan of preemptive education. If I can tell, like if I can tell these young girls before they've embarked on sex, mm-hmm. don't be scared. These are the things to look for so that mm-hmm. if you ever hear a gynecologist tell you of pap- you have HPV, you're not freaking out. You've heard yeah. about it when you were yeah. like 16 or 17. That would be yeah. healthier, right? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And I think that's a great thing also with the internet as well, right? Yeah. And like the dissemination of information, well, at least knowing which information to intake, the, yeah. the evidence-based yes. and the sound information that's going on. Yeah. And I feel like even before the, we just go after the the topic of OBGYN, I think there's one persisting topic that's outside of cervical health, that mm-hmm. which is your field to answer, is the COVID vaccines have been out for a year now. For, right. Yeah, exactly a year now. Yeah. We have heard every misinformation under the sun um, about the COVID vaccines and specifically pregnant women, right? Mm-hmm. And for those yep. who are trying to be pregnant, it causes infertility, it causes spontaneous abortion, stillbirth. There was a period in time last year where there were like pregnant women should not be next to vaccinated people because vaccinated people can shed the virus. Right. Um, Which, yeah, is not true. The, Couldn't be the true. Physiologically, of, scientifically, yeah. Yeah, the fellowship of, I mean, ACOG has said, vaccinate pregnant women, this or that. And obviously, there will always be a population of hesitant and resistant and anti-vaxxers. What is your take and your message for those who are watching? Pregnant, wanting to be pregnant, afraid. Um, And I always say it's expected people are afraid and it's understandable how people are afraid, especially in such a sensitive moment of you're carrying a baby inside of you. Um, As someone who's worked in this and uh, as a mom yourself, Mm -hmm. would you have taken the vaccine if you were pregnant? And as the expert again, what would you say in this topic? Yeah. So actually, listen, this is what I say. 20 times a day in my office, I say to patients, <laughs> I am happiest when our governing bodies, like ACOG or Society for Maternal Fetal yeah. Medicine, I'm happiest when their dictums and their evidence-based medicine coincides with not only what I see anecdotally, but also what I would tell my sister. Meaning, if anyone out there was my mm-hmm. sister, I would make her do the vaccine if she were pregnant. And if it was my daughter, I would make her do the vaccine if she were pregnant. Mm -hmm. What I see anecdotally, so forgetting data, what we in my practice Mm -hmm. are seeing, and we deliver a lot of babies every year, is our pregnant patients who are getting COVID, which is all of our pregnant patients, by the way, vaccinated or not, boosted or not, they are getting exposed to it and they are getting it. But the ones who are vaccinated and boosted are getting it either asymptomatically or very mild. And our sickest patients have definitely been the the unvaccinated ones. And I do think, listen, it's really valuable to kind of make it clear that we don't assume that anyone who has declined the vaccine is an anti-vaxxer in the way Mm -hmm. that we use the term anti-vaxxer nowadays, right? We know that these women are being rational in how they feel, but their fear is somewhat irrational. And we understand that because when you're pregnant, you have a lot of things that make you nervous. Mm -hmm. What I would really try to urge women to think about and understand is this. What I say often is we're not looking at three choices. We're not looking at no COVID, COVID or vaccine. No COVID is not an option. I mean, I have patients who are like, I don't leave the house at all, but their husband leaves the house or their child is in daycare or they have a babysitter come in or they go to buy food, right? So unless you're literally isolated in a bubble with only one partner who doesn't leave the house and someone drops food in front of your house and doesn't even come in, which I would never advocate for, by the way, that sounds incredibly unhealthy, but but for those people, and you're still going to the doctor. So you're still going to get, you're going to get exposed at some point. So no, no COVID is not an option right now. The options are what we know, 
which COVID unfortunately absolutely is causing higher risks of preeclampsia, preterm labor, and stillbirth. And that's COVID. That's mm-hmm. the COVID infection, not mm-hmm. the vaccine. Mm-hmm. The women who are vaccinated either aren't getting it or they're getting milder disease. And so really, really, if we look at those, then it makes more sense to do the vaccine. I have many yeah. patients today, I have several patients today say, but we just don't have long-term data on the vaccine. This is true. We don't, right? We have some, more long-term than people think because the mRNA vaccines yeah. have been studied for a while. Yeah. But first of all, the mRNA degrades in your muscle quickly. And what's left is the antibodies that do cross the placenta to help the baby. Mm-hmm. Second of all, we know that you don't find mRNA in the amniotic fluid, in the placenta, or in the umbilical cord samples. And third of all, what we know is we do have short and long-term data about COVID and it is causing harm in pregnant women. Absolutely. And so yeah. I think to me, it's one of the one of the few times where it's actually really clear, but it's one of the times where the internet has mucked things up because now you get to hear not just doctors whose boots are on the ground and scientists yeah. who have studied this and people who are not profiting from it. Like you and I don't profit yeah. from COVID. I mean, we are suffering from COVID, right? <laughs> Nothing about COVID is making our lives better. Yeah. Um, but then you have people who aren't involved in it who do have actually profit at play. The people who are largely disseminating the poor information are the ones who are selling a lot of supplements. Yeah. Yes. And so I, it's it's a hard time. It's a hard time to be in it's, it's a hard time to be a pregnant woman, but it's a hard time yeah. to be a practitioner, right? And have yeah, to, yeah. And I think yeah. with as with everything in medicine, right, Doc, it's almost a risk benefit analysis. Yeah. Um completely. And as we have yeah. seen so far, the benefits from the vaccines like outweighs any risk. And the risk from the actual virus itself. <laughs> um, it's right. so, so heavy. So, so, yeah. so, so heavy. The gravity of the effects of the virus itself is yeah. it's torn apart families. It has broken a lot of dreams and this, this, or that. Um, and it's so really it's, ruined yeah. our medical system in some yeah. ways. I mean, this yeah. is what I've said, but yeah. the fact is, it will be harder for you to get your screening test like your mammograms yeah. and your pastures because mm-hmm. your doctors mm-hmm. don't have as mm-hmm. much time. It will be harder mm-hmm. for you to get treated in the hospital mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. unrelated to COVID issues because yeah. there are really not enough doctors and nurses and resources. Yeah. And so I do think, like you said, it is so risk versus benefit. So I guess I would kind of implore the public if you don't want to listen to the huge governing bodies, because I get it. Like, I think that we all yeah. still have a little bit of, you know, how much do we trust yeah. the people who yeah. are in charge of oh, our yeah. government yeah. who don't yeah. always do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. But even if you don't trust the big governing bodies, if you listen to your doctors, like, again, we're not profiting. We don't give the vaccine. There's yeah. nothing about COVID that's helping us. And yet we see it. So we would have, you and I would have no reason to say anything in support of the vaccine other than yeah. the fact that like, I haven't seen any patient get vaccinated who has had anything wrong. And I see yeah. hundreds of patients a week mm-hmm. and I've seen many patients with COVID have other things that were wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. And what I've always said is that for you specifically, um, you're the same doctor, the same physician that people go to when they're pregnant, when they're going for their tests when they're going for this or that even prior to the pandemic right. and you're the same practitioner who's saying who's advocating for the safety and the effectivity of these vaccines like let's continue to trust the physicians that we go to and we trust our lives and our loved ones lives even prior to the pandemic right yeah. and this whole pandemic talk and this whole pandemic for i can't believe it's two years now during three years yeah, i was telling my friends um, oh yeah, last year or last year, I was like, oh wait, no, it's, yeah. it's been more than a year. I know. I said today, yeah. like two, you know, COVID years are like dog years. So two years is really 14 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And it's taken such a heavy, heavy toll. Yes, individually, globally, but especially the medical system, the healthcare system, the workers, people are out sick, people are left because they're burnt out and mm-hmm. I don't blame them. I don't blame um, them. But even prior to COVID, the healthcare sphere has always been a field of stress because mm-hmm. not just all of the mind that it's involved, but all the emotion that's involved, right? Especially as a practitioner as yourself. How do you decompress out of work, out of this yeah. heavy, heavy, heavy field of medicine? Well, I will say, and I do think that's really important. I, I'm like, on one hand, I'm such a doer. I like doing things and I'm lucky that I have like great friends and my family and kids and stuff like that. Yeah. But I'm also in many ways, quite lazy. Like I would love to come home from work and lie on the couch. Yeah. Early in my career, when I, 22 years ago, when I was a resident, my husband mm-hmm. and I had just gotten married and he <laughs> was not working, nor has he ever worked as much as I worked, but he wasn't working as much. And so I'd come home from 36 hours as a resident back in the day when we did 36 hours straight, yeah, yeah. straight, 
no sleep. Mm -hmm. You're at the hospital. And all I'd want when I come home is to sleep. And my husband early in the game would force me to like, I mean, go watch like foreign films where we'd have to be like <laughs> reading subtitles, things like that. And I remember being so annoyed, but the truth is I joke, I think it was actually the best thing because it actually reminded me that if all I did was work hard and then come home and rest, then I would get bitter and angry. And I think yeah. the one thing that's really saved me from feeling bitter and angry is that Yes, it makes life harder because I work my butt off and yet I still, you know, I work hard and I play mm. hard. That's exhausting. But I think it saved me from feeling anger and bitterness because you do give up so much. I mean, yeah. every time someone has like a wedding or a party or anything, yeah. my response always has to be like, well, let me see if I'm not on call. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's hard. Like that's 22 yeah. years of like, no, nope, yeah. I might not be there for Christmas or Thanksgiving because, yeah. you know. I work on yeah. Christmas and Thanksgiving yeah. often. And so, yeah, I think that the best way to not burn out, well, first of all, is just to actually really, you and I like talking to people and that's yeah. helpful. So I would say yeah. to anyone wanting to be a doctor or a nurse, if you don't like talking to people, do not do this. <laughs> really. Don't be a teacher. Don't be a nurse. Yeah. Don't be a doctor. Um, and I would say you still have to force yourself to not sit home and do nothing afterwards. Yeah. You'd be really tired. Yeah. Um, oh, someone just said, I've lost a lot of weight. What's my secret? Thank you. <laughs> nothing's a secret in my world. Um, we should have a whole nother talk about weight. So yes, long story please. short, cause you and I should jump off in a minute, but I, did, so I did gastric bypass 11 years ago, which I was very mm -hmm. open about. And then I mm -hmm. had a baby afterwards, which mm -hmm. challenged my weight a lot. Mm -hmm. And then recently I went to my endocrinologist because my metabolism at 52 sucks. And after chemo and menopause <laughs> and yo-yo dieting, I will never advocate for yo-yo dieting. Um, mm -hmm. so she put me on semaglutide the newer mm -hmm. medications yeah, that yeah, are yeah, really yeah. helpful. And so I still is have- Is it like different... Ozempic kind of? It's Ozempic, yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of different brands, but yeah. Ozempic is one of them. Yeah. And it's a it's a weekly shot and mm -hmm. it's still, I still have to do the work of like eating healthier and not eating a mm -hmm. lot of junk and carbs and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, but it just, it helps. It makes it easier to stick with it. So There we go. That's there it. we go. Yeah. yeah. But there thank you. Whoever said that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, Doc, um, we have learned so much. And uh, thank you for joining me and raising awareness for Cervical Health Month. It's such, such an important topic, you know, um, especially in a topic and field where so much misinformation and disinformation linger every mm -hmm. single day here in the internet. And thank you for sharing your journey with us. And thank you for saying yes to me for this conversation. Thank That's you so for much inviting fun. me. Listen, you have such good energy. You have the <laughs> best hair I've ever seen. I'm like deeply <laughs> envious of that amazing hair. And honestly, thank you for like for working hard in in the field that you're in is so challenging mm -hmm. and to be in New York City. And then to still be trying to educate is really good. So I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you but yeah, so, so tell everyone, go to Tribe Called V yes, Tribe on Called Instagram, v, we'll go on our it, website, yes. and I'm going to have more of the gynecology content coming out soon, because right now it's heavy on the pregnancy stuff, mm -hmm. but that's because now I have time to do more gynecology stuff. There yeah. we go. Dr. Shiva, again, thank you. Thank you so much. You. Have a great night. We'll have another right. session again. We'll have another session days. soon. Good. Yes, we Perfect. will. There's a lot to talk about. And feel well, okay? Thank you so much. Have a good Thanks. night. Bye, Bye. Bye everyone. We have now reached the end of the story. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Friends of France. I hope you had an enjoyable adventure learning about our expert guests, their work, and why they do the things that they do. Please check out the rest of the series available on all podcast platforms. Please also consider following the podcast on the platform that you prefer. Turn on the alerts for new episodes so you don't miss new stories. And give us a rating to support the show. You can find more updates on the podcast's official Instagram at Friends of Franz Pod or my personal Instagram at Chris Franz. That's without the I because there is no I in team. <laughs> I'm kidding. Someone already took the username. Have a great day or night, everybody.